but really, what gives us uh, any evidence to suggest that gene therapy is a good target uh, treatment for HIV? And I'm sure to many in this group, uh, the man on the screen requires not much introduction. Uh, Timothy Ray Brown is also known as the Berlin patient. He's the only known individual cured of HIV to date. Uh, and the treatment that he received that led to his functional cure uh, was pretty complex. Timothy developed AIDS-related leukemia, or cancer in the white blood cells, uh, and required a lot of treatments uh, that eventually led to his current uh, health status. And I'm going to pick apart sort of the three things in the field that are thought to have led to the cure that was achieved in Timothy Ray Brown, and then I'll talk about how uh, we're using gene therapy to systematically deduce whether some or all of those components uh, could contribute to a gene therapy-based care for many, many more patients. So the first piece of this puzzle was that Timothy received a, what I call fully loaded bone marrow transplant, and he actually received two of these. And the main take home here is that that particular treatment involved what we call myeloablative conditioning, or intensive treatment to essentially wipe out all of his existing blood cells and blood cell production. Um, this not only got rid of many of the HIV-infected cells in his blood, but it also created a lot of space for uh, new cells to take over blood cell production, and specifically in his case from the donor. Now, the donor uh, in the second transplant that he received happened to also carry a mutation in a gene called CCR5. And this is a gene we call a co-receptor for HIV entry. Um, it's a small protein expressed on the surface of T cells and, and some other cells that HIV will use to um, infect cells. And when CCR5 is not expressed on the surface of cells, such as in the donor of Timothy's second bone marrow transplant, um, HIV is um, not able to infect those cells, so the cells are actually resistant to HIV infection. Now, because Timothy received myeloablative conditioning, these donor cells were able to go in and actually form new blood cells, including T cells, uh, that were HIV resistant. And then the third thing, or third component of this treatment was that these HIV-resistant T cells uh, in the, from the donor actually recognized all cells that were Timothy's as foreign and mounted a pretty significant immune response. This is uh, something we refer to as graft-versus-host disease. Uh, and this is important, too, because it's possible that this, um, these T cells from the donor then went out and sort of recognized any residual HIV-infected cells that were Timothy and eradicated them. Now, in gene therapy, we're typically talking about using a patient's own cells, so we can't really get at this graft versus host disease component, but we can systematically evaluate both the conditioning piece and the HIV-resistant blood cell piece. So we currently have two clinical trials enrolling patients uh, with AIDS-related leukemia to get at the conditioning piece, and we're targeting this patient population because it would be appropriate to treat them with things like chemotherapy that are used in conditioning. The first of these trials is treating patients who have just been diagnosed who are receiving their first-line treatment of chemotherapy, which acts as a mild conditioning, so not a fully loaded, but it's going to create some space for cells to go in and then graft and produce new blood cells. The second trial is actually going to take patients who have the same diagnosis but have already failed that um, first-line treatment. Their, their cancer has come back, and so basically they would be candidates for transplants, and they are going to require a fully loaded conditioning regimen. And this will allow us to compare whether mild conditioning or fully loaded conditioning is more beneficial um, to the gene therapy treatment. And we don't know in any of these cases if we'll be able to achieve enough um, gene-modified cells or HIV-resistant cells in these patients. So we've included in these um, trials a gene that's resistant to chemotherapy. So if these patients go on to receive more chemotherapy after their gene therapy treatment, the gene-modified cells are, protect are protected from that chemotherapy. Um, and so it would be a way for us to increase the number of gene-modified cells if too low levels are observed after their treatment. Now, to render these cells HIV resistant, we're actually using a, a dual strategy. So, as I mentioned, Timothy's donor had a naturally occur occurring mutation in CCR5 that prevented it from being on the cell surface. Uh, we've actually introduced a mechanism that doesn't require you to have that mutation, but will basically degrade any CCR5 in your cells before it has a chance to get to the cell surface. 
to mimic um, what had happened there, but is uh, basically viable in many different patients' genetic backgrounds. But uh, one of the elegant things about the HIV virus is that when it can't find CCR5, it will sometimes try to find other receptors that it can use. Uh, one, another one is called CXCR4. Um, and so we also introduced a small protein called a C-peptide. Um, this is actually a mimic of a piece of the, the um, HIV um, viral envelope that attaches to the cell surface. And this actually prevents the cell from taking up HIV regardless of which, express, um, which co-receptors are expressed. So it's really kind of a double whammy to prevent HIV resistance in these patients. <laughs>